All right, well, let's look, at, look to the scripture this morning, in John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, the book of John, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are thankful for your presence. We're thankful for the resurrection. In this season of Easter, in the season of the resurrection, God, we rejoice that you overcame sin and death and gave us a way to enter into your presence, not just in the future, but even in this moment. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. God, I ask that you would speak through me, fill me with your Holy Spirit, give me a fresh anointing today. May my words be your words this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what can we say about Thomas? Right? In the aftermath of the resurrection, this is his story. And you know, for thousands of years, I think this guy has gotten a bad rap. I really do. You don't even have to be a church person or know about the Bible uh, to know that he, Thomas here, one of Jesus' uh, disciples, is commonly known as the doubter, or Thomas the doubter, or doubting Thomas, right? It's in our American lexicon. Did he have doubts? Well, there's no question he had doubts. But I want to ask you this morning, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I mean, honestly, be honest with yourself. You see, it wasn't just Thomas, but for all of the disciples, nothing really played out as they thought it would, right? I mean, just three days prior, it seemed as though uh, the hopes that they had uh, of, of any of them, that any of them had in Jesus had been dashed. It wasn't that these, uh, these men were not people of faith. They certainly, throughout uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, demonstrated that they had a belief in God, that they had a belief and an understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, they had just not put it all together. They just didn't quite understand all that was going on. And Jesus had told them time and time again what was going to happen on multiple occasions, but it's as if they had no category for what he was telling them. And then after his death and resurrection, what would happen? And to be honest, amongst many realities that they were facing, I think that Thomas and the others were actually disappointed. They were disappointed. With all of the miracles that they had witnessed over those previous three years leading up to Jesus' death on the cross, they had to have been thinking what others actually said to Jesus while he was hanging there. If you are God, can't you get down from there? 
Can't you perform some sort of miracle in this moment to get you out of this desperate situation? They weren't saying that, but they were, some of them we, we know were looking off from a distance, seeing Jesus hanging on the cross. And I wonder if they were, if they were feeling the, 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 the same thoughts and, and the words were coming to them as well. And yet we know that even though Jesus had the power to do that, he didn't. Why? Because in order for him to fulfill the mission that God the Father had given him, he had to be the lamb who was slain, not the lamb who pulled a trick out of his magic hat and made it all go away. And I can't help but think what it must have been like that, uh, for, that, uh, for the disciples on that Saturday in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. I mean, do you think the disciples met in the upper room and said, can't wait for tomorrow? Probably not. They were just trying to figure out what just happened. You ever have something happen traumatic to you? I mean, I, I, I can think of, and I've mentioned this before, I was in Manhattan on 9-11, and I grew up there, and, and for me, and, and all of you who watched that day, wh wherever you were, when I saw the first building fall, I, I just I didn't have a category for it. I couldn't imagine it. And I, and I found myself saying, along with the rest of America and the rest of the world, what just happened? How do we move forward from here? What do we do now? And for the disciples, they must have been asking, are we even safe to go out into the streets and be seen? Remember Peter's denial. I think that Peter's denial was in a, in a way a disassociation so that he didn't get hung on a tree himself. He's saying, oh, I'm going to distance myself from Jesus in, in, in an effort of self-protection. Now, permit me to be forward this morning. If you have faith in Jesus, when it comes to your belief in him and your commitment to him, what are your doubts? What are your doubts? Do you believe that he's good? Do you believe that he's still working in this world? Do you believe that he heals? Are you confident that he can still save you? Or is there an enormous mountain in your way that you feel he can't move? And ultimately, in this season of Easter, do you believe in the resurrection? Amen? All right, I know you believe it, Ruth. <laughs> or are you like Thomas, who needs something a little bit more before you believe? I just want to make a quick comment before we go any further, specifically as it relates to doubt. There are many different kinds of doubt, but I think that there's a prevailing thought that some promote, even within the church at times, that says that we are never to have doubts, right? Right? And maybe it's not overt, maybe there's an undercurrent of thinking uh, that if you have doubts, you should deny them, you should suppress them or ignore them, but never actually deal with them. And I want to tell you this morning that Jesus can handle your doubts. And the road to deep faith is often marked with moments of doubt. Or another way to say it is every doubt is a stepping stone to stronger faith. And so I want to suggest today that Thomas, the disciple widely known as the doubter, actually displays a tremendous amount of faith when he encounters the resurrected Christ for the first time. And we're in a series here at Newbridge that we're calling Aftermath. Where we're exploring the impact or the aftermath of the resurrection. How did the resurrection affect those early disciples? And more importantly, or as, as importantly, how does it impact you and I today, you and me today? 
Now, let me set this up for a, a little before we revisit our text for today. It's still the day of the resurrection. It's still the first day of the week. It's still Resurrection Sunday. Word has spread that Jesus has risen from the dead. And so the disciples gather, lock themselves in a room, and wait for Jesus to appear. And he does. Somehow he just appears to them, even though the doors are locked. And so we revisit the text on the evening of that first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't berate them for scattering, right? As Pastor Brian emphasized so well last week, Jesus does not lecture Peter about his denial, right? Or, or he doesn't say, hey, man, you guys really left me when I needed you at the scene of the cross in my most desperate hour. He says very simply, and this is the beauty and the grace of our Lord, peace be with you, shalom. All peace in all ways at all times be with you. But someone is missing. And Jesus tells Mary Magdalene and the others to go and tell the disciples that he has risen and to wait for him to appear to them. And that's what they're doing. But Thomas, Thomas ignores Jesus' request to gather because very simply he doesn't believe that the news is true. Verse 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now, just in case you're wondering if Thomas was the only one who doubted the news of the resurrection, in Luke's gospel account, when Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and some of the others told the 10 disciples news of the resurrection, they did not believe her either. They said it was, quote, nonsense. And I want you for a minute or two, or just for the rest of this morning, to try to put yourself in their shoes for a moment. I think it's important to understand Jesus' resurrection challenged everything the apostles had ever known and believed about the Messiah for their entire lives. It was against all of their traditions. Certainly the Messiah wasn't supposed to die. And even though the apostles witnessed many signs uh, proving that Jesus was extraordinary, and he was, here's the thing that they had to grapple with or they were grappling with in this moment. He still died like any other person. He still took his last breath. His heart stopped beating. And so as I've already mentioned, the, the crucifixion sent all of his followers, not just Thomas, not just the other 10, but all of his followers into a tailspin of doubt. You see, what I think what makes Thomas different than the others, maybe what made him not show up that first day in the upper room was not only his doubt, but his desire to have a fervent belief because he was an all or nothing type of guy. And I really get that because I'm the same way. My wife tells me all the time, she says, you're either all in or all out, Tim Daniels. And so, yes, I understand this. I'm all in here at Newbridge Church. Now, we don't hear a lot uh, from Thomas uh, throughout the, the Gospels. But here's the thing. When we do... Contrary to how he's been labeled for all these years, I think unfairly, we actually see in the gospel accounts a strong faith. Let me illustrate this for you. When Jesus learns that his, friends, his friend Lazarus has died, this happened just a couple weeks before the account that we're reading today, he tells his disciples that they must return to Judea. Uh, and they try to talk him out of it. And the reason why is because the last time that they were there in Judea, people were ready to stone Jesus to death. And so they're afraid. They're saying, Jesus, we, we shouldn't go back there. Remember the last time? But Jesus insists that they go. And then 
in opposition to what others are saying, Thomas boldly speaks up and he says, he said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That is not a statement of doubt. That is not, an un, that is not a wavering faith. He's saying if we return, whatever happens, I'm all in. This is not cowardice. This is courageous. Thomas is essentially saying, if we die with Jesus, as he puts himself in harm's way to help a friend, Lazarus, then so be it. Doesn't sound like a doubter to me. That sounds like someone who is willing to lose their life for Jesus. And just so you know, and I'm going to circle back to this at the end as we close today, Thomas would eventually be martyred, not for his doubt, but for his faith in Jesus. Let's continue, John 20, verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Not everybody who was crucified was nailed to a cross. Some of them were, uh, the ropes were hung, uh, uh, wrapped around their hands, and the effect was essentially the same. They had to, 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 to pull themselves up to just, just to draw a breath. But for Jesus, he was nailed to the cross, and so he had wounds. He had marks. And so what, Tom, what is Thomas saying? He's saying, I believe, uh, I, I, I am not sure, I need, to be, I need to see to believe. I have to know for myself, he's saying. If this is true, that Jesus is risen, it demands the entirety of my life. If it's not, I have no hope at all. If he is risen, the possibility of new birth and a living hope can be realized. But if not, we're all just playing around, is what he's saying, I think. And I want you to consider with me for a moment what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. This is probably uh, the most uh, detailed uh, description theologically of the resurrection. Uh, there's a couple uh, uh, Jews that don't believe in the resurrection. So Jesus is addressing all of that. And by doing so, he's addressing the, the resur- essentially the jes- resurrection in general. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is used useless, and so is your faith. And he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and what? You are still in your sins. But we know that with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he absorbed our sins. He took them away. He made it possible for, we, for us to enter into the presence of God. The, 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 the curtain in the temple was torn in half, and we are able to go into the presence of God. Amen. But for Thomas, he had to know. I read one scholar, D.A. Carson, who's uh, one of, a very prominent scholar of, of this day. He says, this is the doubt of someone who has suffered massive religious disappointment and doesn't want to be had. There's a huge part of him that admires and respects, reverences everything he has known about this Jesus, yet his hopes are in the tomb with Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, are your hopes in the tomb? Or in the resurrection. You know that feeling when your world is, is upside down for one reason or another? And you're desperately wanting things to look right side up again. But you say to yourself something like, in order for that to happen, in order for my world to be in order, this or that needs to happen so that I know that things are okay. And Thomas, I think, feels let down, and he doesn't want to blindly trust again. He's determined to separate genuine faith from mere gullibility. And I think he wants to be certain that his beliefs are based on truth. This is an outcry of a disillusioned skeptic. And so in the aftermath, after that first Easter Sunday, when it comes to you And your life, when it comes to me and my life, the questions that we might have, 
Our hopes and dreams and aspirations, are they in the tomb? Are they in the resurrection of Jesus? Listen, there are some of you right now that have doubts. And I want to tell you that God may allow you to have doubts so that you will seek him. And when you find him, you, like Thomas, will give him your entire life. Everything that he wants from you, everything that he asks from you, and everything, and he will give you everything that he desires for you. And there's something else. Since when have hard questions been bad? I remind you that even Jesus on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a hard question. See, Thomas had to know for himself. And here's the truth. Some of the greatest people of faith that have gone before us started out with doubt and actually continued to have doubt, sincere doubts throughout their lives. A few of them come to mind. C.S. Lewis, who is arguably one of the most prominent theologians of the last century, did not believe in God. He had a ton of questions. He had a ton of doubts. And yet, How many a preacher still refers to his great works uh, about his relationship and our relationship with our God? The reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, had great doubts and questions. The great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, had a ton of questions. Mother Teresa questioned even our own Pastor John, as he has shared and preached from this very platform over the years, has told us that he had great doubts especially in his early years. He was a philosophy major. That is a, that is a degree full of questions and not many answers. Come on. <laughs> and if we look within the pages of Scripture, we can see doubt over and over again. When we read through the Psalms in particular, we see the various different psalmists riddled with doubt. How long, O oh Lord? Will you save me? How long do I have to spend this time in the depths of the sea, in the abyss? Will you rescue me, Lord? Those are all questions of doubt, and yet we see also within the Psalms great faith. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and this time Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, again, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And notice that Jesus greets Thomas just like he did the week before with the other disciples. Peace be with you. All peace in all ways at all times be with you, Thomas, my friend, my disciple. And similarly, he does not berate Thomas for his doubts. Instead, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, now don't miss this, my Lord and my God. Many scholars agree that this is one of the most definitive declarations of who Jesus is by pretty much anyone in the New Testament. And Thomas has had a whole week to contemplate this. Questions like, is he really alive? I, I hope he is, but I can't bear it if it's not true. How do you kill someone who has walked on water, who calmed the stores, who, storms, who healed the sick, even raised others back to life? Thomas might have spent those days reflecting on Jesus' teaching. On the, on the night he was betrayed and arrested, He said, do you not know that he who has seen me has seen the Father? Or back in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. Or in chapter 5, whatever the Father does, the Son also does. 
And Thomas must have been wondering, was all of this actually true? And yet here, this declaration by Thomas here in the upper room is a de- declaration of belief that Jesus is in fact Adonai, Elohim, yod heh vav He is the Lord God Almighty. And Jesus simply says, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas listens to him. Now, I, what I want you to notice is that Jesus did exactly what Thomas needed to believe. And yet, as far as we can tell in the text, it's not in the text, as far as we can tell, Thomas never actually puts his finger in Jesus' side. He never actually, as we can see, puts his hands into the wounds on Jesus' hands from the nails. And yet he believes. He believes because he's in the presence of Almighty God. He believes because he sees the Lord and he's in his presence. And I wonder this morning, what is it for you? What is the condition that you put on your faith like Thomas did? If I see, then I will. What are your conditions? Jesus obliged, but I don't think Thomas actually took him up on the offer. He believed, and he declared it to be so right then and there. I've had many seasons of doubt throughout my life. In fact, I still do. When my dad unexpectedly died when I was 15 years old, my world turned upside down. And the result through those late teen years was a prolonged season of doubt. And I suppose that like many teenage and college age kids, I asked a lot of questions. I grew up in a house of faith. And so is this faith really my faith or just the faith of my parents? Do I believe that God is good Can good things emerge from bad circumstances? Is God listening or am I just speaking into the air? These are the big size doubts and questions that I had, but God in his grace and his mercy did not push me away in spite of my doubting. No, he didn't. He was ever by my side walking with me through those seasons, saying to me in a way, peace in all ways, at all times, be with you, Tim Daniels. And friends, I need you to know this morning that he promises to do the same for you and with you. For me, there were moments in those later high school years when I heard the voice of Jesus speaking over me, telling me that he was right there by my side in that moment. He even called me by my name. And so for me, that season was marked by rebellion and doubt, and yet God in his grace never left my side. He didn't scold me for my unbelief. He didn't, he didn't berate me for my wayward ways. No, he said, I'm here, Tim. I'm waiting for you to come back to me. What are the things that you are challenged with? What are are the seasons of doubt and unbelief that you have? You know, I can't help but think four years ago about the pandemic, especially in those early days. Everybody was asking, God, are you in control? Right? I was asking as a pastor, how do we do what we do if we can't get together? Right? And we had to Pivot became the word of the day, word of the year, right? We pivoted here, there, and left, and everywhere, and we had virtual Zoom, Zoom calls upon Zoom calls and live streaming. I never wanted to be a TV preacher, but I was, I was a TV preacher all of a sudden, <laughs> preaching to an almost empty room, my wife and Angie and Olaf, and that was about it, the sound folks, the band. But, you know, in those early, uh, early weeks and months of the pandemic, Everything seemed upside down. And there was this existential question for those of us who have faith, like, okay, God, are you in control? I believe you're in control, but I'm not seeing this right now. Everything is haywire. 
or even this morning as I read the news. Bad news this morning. God, are you in control? Are you sovereign? The war in the Middle East is expanding. And honestly, I don't know about you, but it gives me a sense of dread. But I trust that God is sovereign, that he is in control, and that he's not surprised by any one of these things that I've mentioned and more. Because it involves, it invites me into God's presence to lay everything down before him. You know, one of the biggest reasons that anxiety raises up in our lives is that we have this illusion that we should be in control of everything. It's an illusion. It's crazy thinking. I'm not in control, really. Are you, are you in control? And you know, when we do that, when we try to be in control, when we try to think, to, to hold things so tightly, what we're doing, we're saying, I am God, and he is not. But he's saying, no, 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 I am the Lord your God. I am the only one. I don't, share, uh, my, 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 I don't share my reputation with anybody else. I stand alone amongst myself. And when you try to control and, and ease your anxiety by trying to take control, what happens? You get more anxious. And Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying let, me, let me take care of things. Faith oftentimes begins with a season or multiple seasons of doubt. Obviously, Jesus had plenty of reason to sternly rebuke his disciples in that moment or Thomas in that room. And yet, in his grace, he received him into his presence. In this aftermath moment, in this doubt that Thomas and the others express, Jesus reassures them that not only, he reassures them not only of the reality of his resurrection, but that he would give them all peace in all ways at all times. Shalom. So I simply want to ask you this morning what are your doubts? What are your conditions? I'm fully aware that there are people that hear, are hearing my voice right now that don't have faith in Jesus. What are your questions? What are your doubts? And I want to encourage you to not be afraid of those things because that is a great way to start. It's a great place to start. And I can promise you that Jesus will meet you in your doubt. And maybe your faith feels small right now. Maybe you lack faith completely right now. And my encouragement and my admonishment to you this morning is to bring your doubts to Jesus into his presence. And I promise you, he will grow your faith. He admonish, he, he, in our doubt, for a, a variety of different ways throughout the scripture, God communicates to us that if we seek him, we will find him. That if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek me and you will find me. Knock and the door will, what, be closed? No, it will be open to you. He says, if you seek me, you will find me. And when you seek me, you will find me with all your heart. There's a story in the gospel of Mark that I love where a man brings his demon-possessed son to Jesus for deliverance and healing in Mark chapter 9. And if you know the story, you know that, that, that this man wants to believe. He wants to see his son get set free. And so he says to Jesus these beautiful, honest words that some of us restrict ourselves from saying because we think that doubt is somehow of the enemy. He says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Some of you need to say today, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. Those are honest words. Those are honest words. Those are real words of, of our human experience and, and wanting to and not really understanding how everything fits together and, and we want to believe. And so the request of God himself is, Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Fill in all of the spaces 
You know, when I get up here on a Sunday morning, I've done the work, I've written the thing, I've spent time, hours and hours meditating, and, 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 and I know that this is not complete. This is not a full work. And so when I wake early in the morning, I say, Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill in all the spaces so that what happens here can be a complete work. And he does. He's faithful. He's good. He's gracious and kind. Well, I alluded to this earlier, but what would end up happening to Thomas as he went through, after this moment, as he went through his life? Well, many countless lives would be changed through Thomas's witness and testimony. History tell us, tells us that Thomas launched a great evangelistic movement in India. In fact, have you ever heard of a, a Martoma church, a Syrian or, or Indian church? It, 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 it's translated St. Thomas. He had such an impact in India that, that they named a denomination after him, St. Thomas. Thousands of lives were changed because of the witness and testimony of Thomas. And to this day, you can go to India and see evidence of his work all over India. Because of doubting Thomas? No. No, he wasn't the doubter. He declared, my God, my Lord and my God. Bearing witness of the gospel and most importantly, the resurrection. And so many people in that first century received the hope of the gospel and were saved because of Thomas's work and testimony. And at the end of, the li- end of his life, Thomas was approached by someone who didn't believe and said to him, Thomas, renounce your faith in Jesus Christ and you will live. Embrace your faith in Christ and we will kill you on the spot. And at that moment, Thomas looked up to heaven and said, never will I deny the one who died for me. That is not doubting Thomas. That is a Thomas full of belief, of faith, of power, of hope, of resurrection life. And they proceeded to tie him to a tree and they drove a stake right through his heart. He's gotten a bad rap. Doubting Thomas, no way. This is a man of true faith. This is someone who surrendered the remainder of his life to the one who died for him. Never again will I sully the name of Jesus, he says. Never I will, will I deny the one who died for me. And so I repeat what I stated earlier at the beginning of the message. The road to deep faith is often marked with moments of doubt. Every doubt is a stepping stone to stronger faith. And what follows doubt, if we bring it to God, is that he will reveal himself to us. And what is sure to follow is a belief that can never be shaken. And so my invitation as the prayer team uh, comes at the end is, if you're struggling with doubt this morning, bring it to Jesus. Bring it into his presence. I promise you that he will meet you in that doubt and turn it into great faith. He is not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your doubts. And he invites you to come and see and taste that he is good. Amen?